for the introduction and it's really a privilege to speak after uh, Ms. Uh, after Indira ma'am. Uh, we have all been always looking up to her uh, in, as, as young lawyers and activists. Uh, I totally agree with uh, uh, Indira ma'am on the points that she has raised on UAPA. However, I would like to go at a much abstract level of the UAPA as to what does UAPA actually stand for and does and why is it that even after since 1967 it still continues to stand in the law books despite the fact that Indian Supreme Court so to say has a very progressive image. So uh, at, at present UAPA has has become the primary arsenal in the hands of Indian state. However, it is equally fallacious to assume that it is the Indian state that is responsible for such a predicament. The nature and the spirit of the law itself makes it a useful tool for anyone who wishes to use it against anyone. So it doesn't matter whether it is a conservative right-wing government or a centrist government or an ultra-left or a left government. No government anywhere in this country, I mean, just imagine Kerala is supposed to be a, a, a state ruled by communists, but we see a lot of cases of UAPA coming from Kerala. So it is, it is actually ideologically agnostic because the law itself is framed in a manner which, is, which will and always uh, criminalize associations and speech. Indian state does not have a very satisfactory history as regards to freedom of speech. It is a very fascinating fact that in the very first year of the enactment of the constitution, in the constitution faced its first amendment restricting the circumference of the free speech. So, and Supreme Court of India has borrowed the Brandenburg test from US, which the test itself is not very good. It's a very problematic and loaded test because it paints all speech as speech worthy of protection, does not go into the normativity of various kinds of speech and what speech should be protected and what should not be protected. However, taking such a problematic test and then applying it in Indian context without giving it much proper thought has led to a situation where Supreme Court has consistently, has always and consistently shied away from declaring any of anti from the from uh, declaring any of the laws which proscribe associations and criminalize speech as unconstitutional it was it, it was never done in case of uapa it was never done in case of tada it was never done in case of quota all these laws were allowed to be lapsed or amended by the parliament or legislative court so we see a clear attempt by the Indian state to refuse to recognize speech and expression as a means of assertion of political sentience and painted as a criminal activity by using tropes like national security, increasing terrorism, and more recently, a very funny ground like embarrassment to the current Indian prime minister. That's actually the charge, that's actually the statement in the charge sheet that has been filed in the court by the police that this protest organized by the, uh, by the anti-CA activists were primarily done to embarrass uh, the current Indian Prime Minister and the Home Minister. Now something, I mean, I don't want to get into the, those people, but anyway, so the genesis of the law and the law itself is that, that it cannot sustain, it should not be allowed to sustain in the law books because it is designed to, pros it is des designed to criminalize free speech. And that can be any speech. I do not make any distinction between secessionist speech or terrorist activity or whatever, because those are very artificial distinctions. Secession, I mean, uh, US, a great US scholar, Ram Kushal, has written a great book, which is called Constitutional Right to Secede. Why is secession not, uh, not recognized as a, as a legitimate political demand? It's a political demand. The answer should come in form of a political answer or a political solution not a law and order problem. So what UAPA does is it simply criminalizes any political demand or any speech and makes it into a law and order problem. The entire context of the speech goes away. Now nobody is concerned about what is the, what were the students protesting about? 
what were the bhima koregaon people protesting about everyone wants to know why did that violence happen and who is supposed to be the guilty one so you Nitesh, shift... I need you to wrap up sorry yeah so that's the only thing uh, about uap i would like to say in uh, in during the uh, in my trial uh, in my trial experience uh, while representing mr sagar as uh, ma'am ma'am jaising pointed out we faced all of those problems uh, case after case uh, being registered in delhi riots conspiracy case a uapa was invoked specially when the judge asked the police to give a detailed account of what is the role of safura and why uh, was ms zargar uh, being charged so instead of giving a detailed reply and delineating the role of the accused the police chose to invoke uapa because that would make the court Uh, that would make the bail application go out of the jurisdiction of the court and it will then obviously the bail becomes almost next to impossible to get so so the use of uapa and uh, clearly specifies and clearly shows us uh, why such a law can should not be allowed to uh, sustain in law books